Good morning, everyone. Welcome to The Sci-Files, an impact exposure series focusing on student research here at Michigan State University. We're your co-hosts, Chelsea Boudou and Daniel Puentes. This summer, our theme is focusing on the relationship between graduate student mentors and their undergraduate student mentees. Mentoring is an important part of research and helps students develop into the scientists of today. Today, we welcome Kyle Card and Jasper Gomez. May you please introduce yourselves? Hi, I'm Kyle Card. I am a six-year graduate student in the Department of Microbiology and Molecular Genetics and the Ecology, Evolutionary Biology, and Behavior Program here at MSU. Hi, my name is Jasper Gomez, and I currently just graduated from Michigan State University from the Department of Medical Laboratory Sciences. So Kyle, you're in your sixth year, and Jasper, you just graduated, you had mentioned. When you say you just graduated, do you mean from undergraduate? Yes, as an undergraduate. Wonderful. What project do you both work on together? So we look at how bacteria evolve and are resistant, given that they haven't been exposed to these drugs for um, multiple decades. So we look at specifically the repeatability of evolution, um, and how this repeatability is influenced or affected by um, the, uh, the, the genetic context of the, the organism. So what I do with Kyle is I'm the person that is in the laboratory doing wet work. And what wet work is, is the person that goes in and does all of uh, the laboratory techniques in terms of uh, sterile technique and doing the plating and doing all of the research, basically. Um, Kyle is the one mostly doing a lot of the information based and doing all of the reading and, and all of the information in terms of the data. And I'm the one that's producing the data. So that's the wet work. Can you tell us a little bit about what your thesis is specifically on, Kyle? Mm -hmm. So our lab is focused on uh, this long-term evolution experiment. Um, so it's an experiment that's been I'm going now for 31 years, uh, since 1988. So back in 1988, my advisor, uh, Rich Lensky, he started 12 populations of E. coli from a single common ancestor. And these populations initially were identical but as they have evolved independently over the course of the 31 years, they've diverged in their genome. So they've accumulated uh, sets of mutations, beneficial, neutral, uh, deleterious mutations possibly. Um, and so all these 12 lineages are distinct from each other. So we're looking at how um, uh, how this history of evolution in this environment, this environment does not have antibiotic drugs in it, so how this history affects um, the susceptibility of the bacteria to different antibiotic drugs. And then um, we're looking at, so given this, this, this history given, um, we find that over the course of time that these bacterial strains become more susceptible or sensitive to these drugs. Um, so we're looking at how this, this, this sensitivity, this loss of intrinsic resistance, how this affects the further course of evolution to increased antibiotic drug resistance when we introduce those back into the environment. Interesting. This sounds like this has a lot of applications for, uh, like you had mentioned, antibiotic resistant uh, superbugs, for example. Yes, that's, uh, it, it's, a, it's, it's a huge problem. It currently, it, it's becoming more severe over time. So uh, the, the CDC estimates that every year in the United States alone, about 2 million individuals will contract a resistant infection. Um, and of those 20, 
20, of those 2 million individuals, about 23,000 will end up dying from them. Um, and the problem of resistance is getting worse. Um, estimates place by the year 2050, about 10 million individuals worldwide will die from resistance infections. And these deaths will outpace those of cancer, which is the next leaving cause, about 8 million individuals. Um, what do doctors do whenever someone contracts this antibacterial resistance uh, infection? How do those people end up surviving? Because you said like 2 million people would get it, but only like 23,000 would die. How do the other million and something end up still surviving? Through, um, so what happens is when a patient comes in, uh, they will be uh, tested, the, the, stu- the strain that's causing the infection will be isolated from the host, and uh, it will be tested um, with uh, antimicrobial susceptibility uh, experiments. So these will determine what resistance these bacteria have and what level of resi- what level of resistance. So both to drugs the, and also what concentration of drugs will it take to inhibit or kill the cells. Um, but those techniques uh, diagnostic techniques are uh, slow. You you have to grow up the bacterium, and then you have to um, run these tests, which themselves take a day or two. So what oftentimes doctors do is they treat infections empirically. So um, they'll look at other cases that they've seen that's in a hospital or um, sort of sort of in the region and sort of they say, oh yeah, bacteria A, whatever that whatever the cause of the infection infection is, um, it's it's resistant it has been shown to be resistant to drugs X, Y, and Z. So we're not going to treat with that those drugs. We'll choose another antibiotic. Um, but like you say, um, Chelsea, a lot of these bacteria are now becoming uh, pan resistant. So there are cases where these empirical um, treatments, these uh, treatments informed by uh, these diagnostic tools, they're not, they're, they're, they're useless. Essentially, whatever you throw at the bacteria, whatever drug you throw at them, they're going to resist. Um, it's to the point now. Um, there's some bacteria. There's some uh, bacterial species like Klebsiella pneumoniae uh, that are uh, resistant to every single drug that we have. So it's quite concerning, um, and hopefully, our work that we've done in the Lansky lab. And in future work, it's, I hope to help with this problem. Well, speaking of your work, what have you seen over these past 30 years? Mm-hmm. What has changed about these different colonies of E. coli? Mm-hmm. So they've all evolved to be more sensitive to the antibiotic drugs that we've tested them. They, all, you know, given that. Uh, loss of uh, intrinsic resistance. So intrinsic resistance is resistance conferred through structural or functional features of the cell. So in bacteria and gram negative specifically, they have um, out an outer membrane. Um, lots of bacteria have uh, not not specific to gram negatives, but many bacteria have. Uh, efflux pumps, which uh, are involved in um, ejecting metabolic um, byproducts, per se, Um, but they also can be used to pump out drugs. 
uh, antibiotic drugs. So uh, we, we've seen that these intrinsic resistant traits decay over time. These, these bacteria become more sensitive. So given, given that increased sensitivity, uh, when we introduce the antibiotic drugs back into the environment, so we evolve these bacterial strains in the presence of these drugs, we're looking at, uh, given the different starting points in susceptibility of these strains, did they more or less reach the same resistance level after one round of drug selection? Or does this history that they've had of evolution in the absence of the drugs, what we call relaxed selection, whether uh, this affects or constrains or potentiates their evolvability of resistance. So what we found is that the strains are they're not evolving resistance to the same final level. Um, and it's not repeatable. Uh, we see we see some evidence for it, but it's not very strong. So contrary to this, on the flip side, we're seeing that um, in, on some strain uh, backgrounds, the evolution of resistance is constrained. The capacity to evolve increased resistance is hampered, it's diminished. And uh, so right now what we're doing is we're going and we're looking at sort of what is the genomic cause for this constraint? What mutations that evolved under relaxed selection, what mutations are causing this constraint? Sounds like if you don't use it, you lose it almost. Huh? Yeah, if you don't use it, you lose it. Exactly. Yep. Uh, trade-offs, they abound in life, they abound in evolution as well. Jasper, I want to direct this question towards you. What particular antibacterial strains are you looking at with these E. coli? Yeah, so we were looking at uh, four different antibacterial uh, strains uh, that don't have resistance to tetracycline, ciprofloxacin, ceftriaxone, and ampicillin. And we look at uh, specific strains that are uh, non-hypermutators, which means that they don't, uh, they don't mutate as quickly as um, their other strains. And the reason, and that is the reason why we specifically look at those is just to, it's easier to see um, what mutations have arisen throughout the fifty thousand generations that we're looked th- looked throughout. And what mutations might be causing sort of constraint or potentiation on resistance evolvability? To clarify, you said non-resistance antibacterial, right? Right. Does that mean that we don't develop? resistance to it? Uh, no. So antimicrobial resistance is that the the bacteria themselves haven't gained resistance to the drug. So really, when we look at all of this, it's not so much um, about us, but more about the microbe. Uh, that's what this, like the main work is about. Like when you when you think about um, getting a type of infection, uh, your, your body itself has a natural uh, immune system to, to target these these microbes. However, we use antibiotics in order to help our body fight it off uh, because not our, our body can't fight everything off. And so we give them, we give our bodies antibiotics to target these bacteria to kill them. So antimicrobial resistance is more talking toward the microbe itself than it is us. And with that, and in a question that you were saying, like, is, are, if we're susceptible as humans, uh, there are people that are allergic to some antibiotics and thus we we can't give them specific antibiotics that that they're allergic to, so we uh, we give them other types that again will hopefully help their immune system fight off these infections. You mentioned that your lab also has mutant lines of these uh, antimicrobial re- resistant. So what Jasper was referring to, bet- uh, making this distinction between mutator and non-mutator, is that like you were saying we use and test for strains that are 
have evolved over the course of this long-term experiment that, like, non-mutators. And the reason why we use those non-mutators is because they've accumulated at most a, a hundred mutations by 22 years into the experiment, uh, compared to the, the mutators which have evolved uh, over a thousand. So it makes the genomic analyses tractable. We can sample from these lineages at different time points across their history and examine uh, their capacity to evolve resistance at these different time points to narrow down candidate mutations that have arisen on these genetic backgrounds. Um, and the non-mutators help us with that. Jasper, what kind of skills have you developed by working in this lab, and how do you plan on using them in the future? So I, a lot of things that I've learned is a lot of like laboratory work in terms of pipetting, like the like the normal um, stuff. Again, pipetting, streaking, plating, making sure that everything I do is sterile because that's a very important thing, and basically setting me up to work in any laboratory. And it's it, it's funny you mentioned in the future. I I currently have a job lined up to work at the state laboratory. Uh, for a project called BioWatch, and that all the techniques I learned in this laboratory are going to be required to work there. Very cool. Are you going to be working with E. coli as well? No, I'll actually be working with a lot of uh, different type of microbes, a lot more, I guess, um, some that are not as uh, dangerous and some that potentially might be, so it's a, it's a range. And uh, I'll also be working a lot with PCR, which is something I also learned in, in the laboratory with, with Kyle. And what is PCR? Yeah, so PCR is a polymerase chain reaction, and it's used in the laboratory to uh, be able to distinguish uh, different types of microbes and expand their DNA. Um, the reason why I say distinguish a lot of different types of microbes and their genome is because that's what I'll be looking at in, in this new job is I'll be getting a lot of samples that aren't known. And I'll be using PCR in order to, to distinguish what type of microbe I'm working with. And uh, it sounds like a lot of these uh, types of genomics were also performed on the different E. coli colonies as well, right, Kyle? Yes. So over the past year, we've been using genomic engineering techniques to take some of these mutations that have uh, arisen on these genetic backgrounds and then introduce them into the ancestor of a long-term evolution experiment. And our hope is by doing so, we can start to narrow down the mutations, those, those that are essential and necessary for uh, constraining resistance evolution that we've observed in some of these lineages. It's really interesting to me that, Jasper, that you've been doing the wet lab stuff, and Carl, that you've been, like, the brains behind it, like, doing the reading and really furthering the project. But now that Jasper is leaving soon, what does that mean for your project, Kyle? Jasper didn't know that I also do wet lab work, too. So I work, I work, on, I work alongside Jasper, and I also work on other projects uh, related to uh, antibiotic resistance and its evolution. Uh, so when Jasper leaves, I will continue to work with some of these genetic constructs that we've made to, to determine how they affect these mutations, how they affect the early, like I just mentioned. Uh, we're also doing a fair bit of whole genome sequencing on our uh, resistant mutant isolates. And we're really looking at and addressing the question of over the course of relaxed selection in the long-term experiment, 
does this affect the targets of these resistance mutations? And in other words, are the targets of resistance mutations correlated, or do they correspond to the loss of intrinsic resistance that we see in these strains? Kyle, you and I are both in MSU best, so I already know that you're involved in stuff, but could you please tell me a little bit of the things that you're in and also explain what MSU best in is now that I mentioned it too? Mm-hmm. So MSU best is an NIH funded program to help graduate and postdoc trainees explore alternative uh, career paths. So science, or, sorry, or scientific careers that might lie outside of academia. And in my time at best, um, it has really facilitated uh, sort of me understanding what options lie outside of this sometimes narrowed focused um, view I get of academia. So for example, um, we've had individuals come to discuss their work in science communication, and I was really taken by that. It's Science communication has always been something I've wanted to pursue. I've, it's been in the back of my mind for a while, and just learning how they got to where they are and sort of the lessons that they've learned along the way. Um, also, FAST has uh, allowed me to do an internship at the uh, Michigan Department of Health and Human Services in the reference laboratory. So what I was doing there was I was examining similar questions to what I have been doing in my dissertation, um, questions of uh, how the susceptibility of clinical isolates specifically affect their capacity to evolve resistance. So I was looking at Pseudomonas originosa isolates that were um, taken from patients around the region here in mid-Michigan and examining uh, their evolvability. And interestingly, I found that um, a lot of these clinical isolates are incredibly resistant to these uh, the antibiotic that I, t- I tested with, which was ciprofloxacin. And um, it, 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 it really, it was, a, it was a, it contrasted sharply with the work and the resistance levels I see in the long-term lines. They do evolve resistance, but they don't evolve to clinical levels of resistance. So it's still pretty low level. Um, So it was pretty, it was pretty alarming actually that even in the small sample set I was using, they were really, really incredibly resistant bacteria. Thank you for that, Kyle. We really appreciate that. And I'm glad that you've had an incredible experience with MSU Best so far. Jasper, it sounds like you're taking a non traditional route after. Now that you've graduated from undergrad, and it seems like you're going into not industry, but government public sector work, uh, what motivated you to go into this route, and uh, what do you hope to accomplish with it? So what motivated me was actually my, was Ky- in a sense, was Kyle. Uh, he All the work that he did, cause my, as, as I stated, that my department was medical lab sciences, so I was more... Coming into MSU, I was more interested in in laboratory work in terms of like the the hospital setting than I was in research and and anything of that sense. But there was uh, working with Kyle on this project, something about noticing public 
public health in, in antibiotic resistance and how I could actually use the major I, I worked toward and applying that to government and, and health and also, you know, seeing that I can make an impact probably there. Um, and another person that kind of motivated me to go in that direction was my professor and one of Kyle's um, committee members is Frances Downs. Uh, she used to be the director of the public health um, lab for Tory here in the state of Michigan. So both of them just kind of, in, in, in their own way, moved me toward that direction than the hospital setting. Um, also, just microbiology in general just seemed like a really cool place to be, and I've always enjoyed it. So I always like staying in that area. And um, it's moving in this, like you said, not industry, but more of like a global health and public health aspect. It kind of also pushed me toward coming back to academia at some point, um, probably to get my master's or my PhD in microbiology. Um, a lot of what you're saying brings me back to a topic that we discussed about when we were uh, going over the One Health Initiative in a previous interview with Wayun and Nally. If, if you haven't heard of it, you should definitely check it out or check out our interview from a previous recording. Now, I will address this question to both of you. What has been your experience working with each other and what have you enjoyed the most about it? Well, Seth has been a fantastic mentee. Um, I've, I've learned that mentorship isn't a one-way street. Um, that oftentimes I have been the mentee and Jasper has been a mentor. So Jasper has taught me how to really organize my thoughts in a way to 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 translate them to in a way that he can understand sort of these high level rather abstract ideas by distillation and um i uh, I'm also incredibly um proud of the work he, the hard work that he put in to uh, the, the projects over the last three years. Um, and what I've learned most is that, you know, mentorship is uh, incredibly, just incredibly fun. Mentoring and sort of tossing back and forth ideas, hypotheses, ways to go out testing those hypotheses with somebody who is just so invested into the process as Jasper has been. For me, the, the experiences that I've had with Kyle, like he said, it's it's the learning that, that being as a mentee and having him as a mentor, I think a really big one that he mentioned was the that being a mentee and a mentor isn't a one-way street. Like it's it's something that you give and take. And Kyle has taught me a lot in terms of, you know, always pushing for, for dreams that I've had. I've always come to him maybe in times of, uh, sometimes even in times of desperation and said, you know, I don't know what to do. And he's always had an answer. There's There wasn't ever a time that I felt with Kyle that he didn't know what to say at that time. And, and that also I think was the other way around with me. I think there might have been times when, when Kyle maybe didn't know and, and he came to me and that sense of knowing that I can help him too and not just uh, he's always there to help me, I think really solidifies a, a bond of mentorship on one another. And I think it'll continue moving forward, even with me not being there with him, um, you know, m moving on. And something that, you know, I always truly like enjoyed uh, being being the mentee of Kyle is that there was never a, a dull moment with him. There was always something exciting uh, going on. And with that being either me and him talking about the experiment, uh, me and him working together in, in the in the laboratory or the data that we would see and just always communicating and always having ideas popping up. Like there's, there was never a time when I was like, oh, I, I have this idea, but I'm too scared to tell Kyle or anything. It was like, oh, I have this idea. Let me tell him. And something always blossoms out of it. And that's that experience that I think I truly will always take and move it forward with anywhere I go. What was also really fun is 
sitting along the backseat place. That's true. Really work. Yep, there was always there was always a, a time when we would have to pour yeah. plates at, at late at night and just you know just if we were alone. There was nobody around that, who's going to be in the laboratory at like ten p.m. and just tossing some music and having a good time. Yeah. So ACDC, yeah. so clean, always clean. Um, you always have to have fun. Science is not work. You have to. You really have to just sometimes just have fun in the lab. But which, and I believe um, that's uh, something me and him we taught each other. I yeah. think it it was if one if someone you know was like too stressed out, we were like, hey, you know, this you're supposed to have fun with this, right? It's not something that's supposed to bring you down. You're doing it for to you know to have fun. And yeah. to to go back to something Jasper said uh, a few minutes ago about me always having the answer to a question, a lot of times. I may have come off like I had the answer, but as we know, science, what, we, what we're doing, the research, there's, there's no immediate answer that we can, we can point to, right? That's the job of researchers, is to figure out the answer. So I think Jasper has been great at that, too, is um, over the course of the three years that we've been uh, mentee mentor, He's become fantastic at understa- understanding that, okay, some of these questions don't have answers yet, but being in, taking the initiative upon himself to search out those answers and to apply what he's learned over the course of this time and go for it. Just, yeah. So, Jasper, uh, I. Jack has really come into his own as a scientist, and uh, I would think that he should, you know, the field of science would be better off with him in it. So. And it's better off now with Kyle. So. <laughs> Thanks a lot for sharing that. That was so heartwarming. I, I really enjoyed hearing that. Yeah, it was really nice. I, I want to take the time to thank both of you for coming in today. Uh, it's really great to hear about both of your experiences. And thank you for sharing it not only with us, but with our audience as well in the local Lansing community. Thank you, Daniel. Thank you, Chelsea. Thank you, Daniel. Thank you, Chelsea. Thank you to all of our listeners for tuning in. And remember, the truth is in the science. If you're a current or visiting undergraduate student that would like to be interviewed with your graduate student mentor, please reach out to us at scifiles at impact89fm.org. See you next week on The Sci-Files.